Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Some years ago, I was at Stanford University, and a student asked me a question I'd never been asked before. If you could be a member of any generation except your own, which would you choose? I had no idea what was behind the question, and all sorts of fancy answers flowed through my mind. But what I said was, I'd like to be a member of your generation. Because the students then, and all of you today who are under 35, you are what is described today as the crunch generation. In the sense that in our global era, many of the grand issues of the world are coming together as never before to create a great crunch of challenges which will need to be answered in your adulthood. Answer them well, and humanity has calm sailing in prospect. Answer them badly or not at all through drift and neglect, and humanity will be in profound trouble. This is an extraordinary generation, the crunch generation. Issues that are economic, environmental, technological, scientific, stretching right down to extraordinary questions about the human future on planet Earth. I've followed Jesus now for more than 50 years. And it's wonderful to see all the areas in which this fresh and constructive Christian thinking but one of the areas that I think is strong in Scripture, but less strong in much of the church, is the sense of time. Time. Generation. Day. Hour. Moment. I was told between the services that you have on your clock tower, the night cometh. That sense of urgency. If you follow it through in Scripture, there are great positive examples and negative examples in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can think of the famous words describing the men of Issachar who followed King David. They were skilled in reading the signs of the times to know what course Israel should follow. And all of you, especially you who are women, can cite the famous words of Mordecai to his niece, Esther. Who knows that you haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this? But you have negative ones in the Old Testament too. Jeremiah taunts the Pharaoh of his day, as one version puts it, King Bombas, King Hot Air, the man who missed his moment. But if we look at the New Testament, sadly, the negative outweigh the positive for an obvious reason. In the Gospels, even the closest followers of our Lord didn't get it. And again and again, our Lord rebukes them. They could understand this, that, and the other, but they didn't understand the times. You're good at reading the signs of the weather, but the signs of the times you don't get. And in Luke 11, our Lord uses the word this generation, this generation, six times. And on Palm Sunday, supremely, they missed it. Looking for a king on a white charger to drive out the Romans? He comes in on a donkey, and they missed him. And our Lord weeps over Jerusalem, as one version says, all because you missed God's moment when it came. But there are positive ones in the New Testament, and I want you to turn and think of the one that you find in Acts 13, 36. Extraordinary chapter. It's the story of the first missionary journey. The Holy Spirit calls out Paul and Barnabas and sends them off. You have a stress on leadership in the chapter, which many people don't miss. For example, one of the elders at the church in Antioch is a gentleman called Menaean, who was part of King Herod's court. Obviously, no fisherman here, someone of extraordinary rank. 
And as they move out on the first missionary journey, they go, first of all, to Cyprus. And who is the first convert on the first missionary journey? The top man in the island, the proconsul, the governor. But there's an awful lot of other things in this chapter. This is the chapter where Saul becomes Paul, his Christian name. One verse, he's Saul, also known as Paul, but after this, he's always Paul. But the heart of the chapter is Paul's great sermon. He's in not his hometown Antioch, but Pisidian Antioch, and visiting as a rabbi. They turn to him in the synagogue and say to Paul, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Imagine asking the apostle Paul if he's got anything to say. <laughs> he's got lots to say, and the whole chapter is his sermon. But he comes to a great crescendo contrasting great King David with King David's greatest son, our Lord. And he says, both of them died. Yes, we need to say to our Muslim friends, Jesus died. He truly died. The Romans didn't make mistakes with their executions. Jesus died as David died. But David's body decomposed in the grave, and our Lord rose again. And as he outlines this great contrast, you have this little throwaway verse. David, after he'd served God's purpose in his generation, fell asleep. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a theologian. I'm a layman, like most of you. You don't need Greek or Hebrew to understand this verse. It's incredibly simple and straightforward in terms of the English words. But put together what Paul is saying, and it creates a challenge that is incredibly inspiring and challenging to all of us today. How do we do what David did so well, served God's purpose in his generation, and finished and fell asleep? I want you to notice four things there, and hopefully you'll think about them as you go back for Sunday lunch and think of yourself this week, this crucial week for the nation. First, there's a surprising tribute to David. David served. You know well that as we read the Old Testament, much of it is quite deliberately written over against the surrounding cultures. Above all, the surrounding culture of Babylon and Mesopotamia, from which Abraham was called, and then the surrounding culture of Egypt, from which the Israelites were later freed under Moses. These two great pagan empires. But in these empires and in those cultures, it would be unthinkable for a ruler to serve. Sadly, the notion of servant leadership has become a cliche. It was unthinkable nonsense then. The idea was that God ruled the heavens, the sun ruled the sky, the lions ruled the animal kingdom, and the ruler ruled his people. And you can see their understanding of the power structure written in stone in their buildings, supremely the pyramids and the ziggurat. And if any of you have been to Cairo or seen any of the ziggurats in Iraq, you know the idea. Broadest at the bottom, the ordinary people. And at the top, a single stone. And everyone was there to rule and serve the ruler. But Moses is the first leader described as a servant of the Lord and a servant of his people. And you have a new type of leadership introduced into the world. And Paul tributes David he served God's purpose. King, yes. Now, if you know Jewish friends, you know that David is second only to Moses as a hero to the Jewish people. Many other great people, Joshua, and all sorts of people down to the great prophets like Isaiah. But David towers above them all except Moses. Think of David, the precocious teenage giant killer, the rebel chieftain, 
the great all-conquering king of his time, the founder of the Jewish dynasty, the sweet singer of Israel whose poems we still love and still sing and still ponder. Think of all the verbs you might have used to describe David. He fought, he conquered, he won, he founded, he danced, he sang. You go on. And Paul picks, served. Obviously, he's thinking of our Lord too. Our Lord who said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. Our Lord who at the end of a dusty day's journey came into the house with his disciples. And you remember the story in those days, you come in like that, the slave would bring on the basin and wash the feet. Sorry, ladies, in those days, no slave in the house. The woman of the house would have had to do it. No woman in the house? All right. The junior disciple would have done it. But our Lord, the master, the teacher, he takes the basin and washes their feet to their not only shock, but their dismay. And you can see how that word serves runs through Paul's writing writing to the first Europeans in Thessaloniki as it is today. He says, you've turned from the false gods to what? He might have said to follow Jesus, to worship the true God. No, he says to serve the living God. I think we need to go back and ponder that. I remember when we first moved from Europe to here, I was shocked when I went on California and Many people were referring to the worship service as the worship experience. Now you can see in America, we're in a consumerist culture. It's all about us. L'Oreal, because you're worth it, and buy what we want to sell to you. We're in an entertainment culture. We're in a culture of political interests that are being served, and so on and so on. It's all about us. We're entitled, and so on. No, no, not with the Lord. It's not a worship experience. It's not here for us. Yes, we're profoundly moved, but we're here to worship Him, and all our praise is for Him. Service is the heart of it all. The second thing you see in the verse, a surprising tribute the king serves. The second thing you see is a strategic task. He serves God's purpose. Now, again, we've got to think of this in its freshness as it would have been to them. Here we are in the Western world or in the lead society of the Western world, and the Western world is characterized by civilizations in terms of dynamism, purpose, enterprise. But where did it come from? We take it for granted, but we shouldn't. I grew up in the East. When I was in my 20s, I studied under a guru. But living earlier under Buddhism and then under Hinduism, the central picture there is a wheel. And you know there are Eastern idea that desire leads to craving, leads to attachment, and binds you to the wheel. And the problem isn't that you die. The problem is you're reincarnated and born and you go around again. Hindus say, on average, 18,000 times. And unlike the Californians in the 60s, reincarnation man, groovy man, groovy. It's a matter of weary fatalism. And you can see the goal is not to be free to be an individual. No, because when you do that, you're caught in the world of illusion. The goal is freedom from individuality, not freedom to be an individual. And you don't find any dynamism and purpose in culture shaped by that philosophy. Of course, in the West, we have our friends who are into secularism and atheism, quite different worldview. In that worldview, everything comes from what? Chance. Richard Dawkins, a stroke of dumb luck. And we're the products of chance, plus a lot of time, plus energy, plus matter, and that's us. So if you read the great atheists, and when I was a student, I had seminars from Bertram Russell, one of the greatest. There is no meaning out there in the universe to discover and follow, no. If you want meaning, do it yourself. You don't discover it, you do it yourself. Bertram Russell's picture was of the Greek giant Atlas 
who carried his own world of meaning on his own shoulders. Terrific. If you're young enough, healthy enough, wealthy enough, and various things, you think you can do it for a while, but for most of life, that's absurd. So in the East, it's a matter of purpose, forget it. And with our secularist friends' purpose, do it all yourself. Not in the biblical view. In the biblical view of the Scriptures, we have a God who's personal and infinite, and He's made us in His image. And so we act into history, and His providence overarches history, and history has purpose despite the brokenness of sin, as we've been singing. And so you have an incredible sense of purpose. And to serve God's purpose, to discover your calling in the world, the gifts God has given you and in each of us, our small spheres of life, to play it out. What an incredible understanding. Now you notice he doesn't say, serve his generation. He says, serve God's purpose in his generation. And that's different. The mistake that many of our Protestant liberal friends have made is to try and serve the generation, to see what the spirit of the age now is, and to try and adapt the gospel into that, which of course is crazy because the spirit of the age is changing all the time. As one man said, well, he who marries the spirit of the age soon becomes a widower because the spirit of the age doesn't last very long. And you can see Protestant liberalism has committed spiritual and institutional suicide by trying to be so trendy and follow every spirit of the age in every moment. No, David served God's purpose in his generation. A third, very obvious little thing you see in the verse, a specific time. David served God's purpose in his own generation. Now, in a way, that's so obvious, you say, what on earth am I making a point of it? When else can we? You can't serve your great-grandfather's generation or your great-granddaughter's generation. We're living today. But the fact is that many people don't live in their day, let alone understand God's purposes in their time. Huge number of people are living in the past. A huge sense of nostalgia over things. You look at it in politics, as many people point out. Much of American politics, conservative politics, wants to go back, back, back to Reagan all the time. Liberal politics, back, back, back to Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society all the time. And those are the great standards, and they've hardly got beyond them. And there are others who are obsessed with the future, the future, the future, and so on. But to live in the present, give us today our daily bread. There is in the Scripture a dailiness. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We're only little finite people. We don't understand all the past, and we can't possibly manage the whole of the future. We're only responsible for our callings today. And tomorrow is today from tomorrow's perspective, and so on. There's one last little wonderful thing in the verse. A surprising tribute to David, a strategic task that he follows, a specific time that he's aware of, and the last little thing is a simple terminus. After he'd done all that, he fell asleep. Now, obviously, Paul means he died. But I'm delighted that many of our versions translate it properly. The Greek is, he fell asleep. Some of the English versions think that's a bit blunt, and, and so a bit, bit, bit vague, and so they turn it into something more factual and say he died. Now, Paul is obviously using a euphemism. You all know what a euphemism is. It's a kinder, gentler way of saying something which might otherwise be rather blunt. Now, in English English, where I come from, we have all sorts of words to talk about death, some of which are more blunt. He croaked. <laughs> he kicked the bucket, or whatever. And Paul is using a euphemism. David fell asleep. But here's the point. It is not, as most euphemisms are, a form of denial. It's a euphemism built on truth. 
None of you were afraid to put your heads on the pillow last night, knowing you wake up this morning with an extra hour of sleep. In the same way, because Jesus died and was raised for the dead, and we are putting our hope in Him because He was raised, so we will be raised, and one day we will put our heads on the pillow of life and we will wake up to be with the Lord forever. And that's why death has no sting for us. And I love the fact you can read of the early church, and sometimes at their funerals they did say, goodbye, sister, or goodbye, brother. But often they used to say, good night, sister, good night, brother. The person they loved had put their heads on the pillow and had woken up to be with the Lord. And David, after he'd served God's purpose, a long time ago by our standards, but in his time, he fell asleep. How about us today? What a generation we live in to try and see if we are serving God's purpose in our own time. The pulpit isn't the place, and Sunday worship isn't the time to talk too much about our modern world, but just a word or two to give you some glimpse of what some of us wrestling with the times believe where we are. And I'm not talking about next Tuesday. If you look globally, just as St. Augustine, the great St. Augustine, lived as Rome fell after 800 years and heard stories of the sack of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths, and when he lay dying in North Africa, the Goths were at the city gates of Carthage and Hippo. And his great work, like the city of God, was his vision of Christian faithfulness living in turbulent times that were shocking to people. But instead of alarmism and despair and fear, they had faith that moved out into these turbulent times, and it was like a bridge that crossed the, even the dark ages. Here we are today. We are living with the decline of the West. Not 800 years, but 500 years. And in the global era, the West is declining. We are seeing a faltering search for a new world order. And if we look at areas like North Africa and the Middle East, you can see the cataclysm of disasters if we fail to establish a world order that's solid. We are beginning to realize what I said earlier about the crunch of problems coming in the global era and certainly in the human future. And as we look more closely, we can see that the American Republic which has been the lead society in the West for a hundred odd years, is suffering a profound counter-revolution, a political and cultural counter-revolution. Political in the sense that the framers' understanding is under assault, and so-called new and improved ways of seeing things are being put in this place. A cultural counter-revolution because there's an assault on 3,000 years of the Western way of seeing human nature and human life, so that life, death, the family, male, female, all these things openly under assault in the new ideas being put forward by the elites on many sides. But then we have to look at the church itself. And the simple fact is, for anyone looking at the church in the modern world, we are the world's first truly global religion, the Christian faith. But the church is flourishing in the global south, sub-Saharan Africa, China, but not really doing well anywhere in the advanced modern world that is the West. And the challenge particularly comes home to America. If we look at Europe, or Canada, or Australia, New Zealand, and other parts of the West, Christians are often a tiny minority, never a majority. But the challenging fact in America is that Christians are numerically a huge majority, but culturally very weak. So that tiny groups like, say, gays and lesbians, who are less than 2% of America, have far more cultural influence than Christians who are a huge number. 
What's wrong? The challenge is to follow Jesus with such faithfulness, integrity, and effectiveness that our faith can prevail over the challenges, the seductions, the distortions of our advanced modern world. The full picture is for another day. But you can see even from a few seconds worth, we are living in an extraordinary generation for humanity, for the world at large, for the Western world, for America, and certainly for all of us who are followers of Jesus. So take this challenge deeply. Tuesday will settle a few things. But the real challenge is what happens before the next election and the one after that to really see if the salt can be salty again and the light can be light-bearing again so that by God's grace we may, as David did so wonderfully, serve God's purpose in our extraordinary generation. What a wonderful church you have. I said after the first service, if only your church could lead and your choir and Bill Sadler could lead the singing of Lord have mercy with the entire American church singing and entering it together as you sung it this morning. Magnificent. May God bless you and God be with you and help you here to serve his purpose in this generation.